Good morning. Hi. Hello, my name is Rebecca Sager, and I'm an associate professor of sociology here, and I just wanted to welcome everyone to the Congregation of the Sisters of St. Joseph's um, Symposium on Living on the Edge, the Causes, Consequences, and Actions um, Regarding Homelessness. And um, our panel today is on the causes of homelessness. And we have four wonderful speakers who are going to speak each for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then we'll have time for questions at the end. So I'm just going to do a brief introduction for each speaker and then just open it up to them. Um, so first, right next to me, we have Peter Len, who is the executive director of the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority. And then down at the end, we have Denise Smith, who is an advocate and homeless survivor at the Downtown Women's Center. Um, and then in the middle here is Dave Snow, who's a professor of sociology at UC Irvine, and actually my former professor from University of Arizona, who um, helps me get the start uh, looking at religion and social movements, and was actually one of my first professors uh, only about, I don't know, should we date ourselves, Dave? <laughs> Some <laughs> few years ago. Yeah. <laughs> and finally, we have uh, Rachel Goldberg, who's assistant professor of sociology, also at UC Irvine. So I'd love to give them all a big welcome, and thank you for coming out today. So Peter, you want to start us off? Good morning. So um, I appreciated the introduction and getting the name of the agency right. It's kind of a mouthful. We LASA is easier to say, and it, it's a joint powers authority between the city and county of Los Angeles. So we're sort of unique hybrid of municipal entities, and we participate in both of those sort of clusters of responsibilities, and also administer the federal homeless assistance grant application and some of the grant funding that comes through the feds and local uh, homeless assistance grants. One of the responsibilities we have every year is to conduct the annual point in time count, which we just completed. And um, that is a responsibility we share with uh, communities around the country that administer federal assistance. We have all have a responsibility to gather a census of homelessness on an annual basis. And it's a, it's a fairly um, high level census that is required of us. But locally, we use the opportunity to do a fairly rich demographic survey where we interview 5,000 people experiencing homelessness across the, the continuum, which is the county of Los Angeles. We actually don't do the three cities of Glendale, Pasadena, and Long Beach. They do their own. But the rest of the county of Los Angeles, we conduct the, the homeless count. Surveys um, which illustrate a variety of factors, um, including um, uh, ethnicity data, income data, age, a variety of factors with regard to people experiencing homelessness. And one of the questions that we ask folks, we ask folks a, a, you know, a number of questions with regard to their, to their, their background and their histories and, and try to infer from that some of the intersectionality in terms of causes for homelessness. But um, we also ask people you know, fairly straightforwardly what they think they're, why did they become homeless? And I think it's it's also really important to recognize that what someone might describe as the proximal cause of their homelessness, I think we all have a tendency just from the you know human nature uh, radical point of view that we all have as an individual, we think of it as our you know our perspective on on what what happened to us is very individualistic. People tend not to think in terms of systemic and root causes for. For it. So people might think about, well, I had this fight, or I have a problem with alcohol, and not think in terms of broader, you know, systemic issues. But we ask everybody the same question. Half the people respond that it was economic reasons. So when you when you ask folks in Los Angeles why they're homeless, it has to do with eviction, it has to do with job loss, it has to do with uh, hours lost. Those kinds of reasons are half of what people articulate as their immediate proximal cause for homelessness. There's another cluster that have to do with sort of uh, social networks, fragile social networks or disintegrated uh, social network, loss of family members, um, which 
you know, intersect with economic drivers, uh, you know, significantly, particularly in a market like Los Angeles, where housing affordability is at crisis proportions, having additional income contribution from other family members is, is you know, one of the main things that keeps people off sidewalks. But, um, you know, those are, those are the two, you know, if you look at those in, in, in sum, that's the main driver for what people say drove homelessness in their, in, their, in their individual case. People will articulate challenges with substance use. People will articulate challenges with mental health issues. Those are uh, small factors. And, um, but I think, you know, it's important to sort of start with a sense of what people say happened and using those, those data also look at what research is indicating. I'm very excited. Now, I'm not a researcher. I'm an administrator. I run public programs. That's, that's what I do. It's what I've done, spent my career doing. So I'm very interested to hear what, you know, what the researchers are going to say about what's going on. But we also, you know, we keep uh, an eye on what's going on. And I think that one of the things that's been really interesting over the years is to look at study after study that shows Los Angeles as the worst, that is least affordable housing market in America. So if you look at Harvard's Joint Center on Housing Studies, they do an annual report on the state of housing in America. And they look at uh, home ownership and rental assistance, or you know, renters and owners, and like who's most burdened. Los Angeles is always at the top of that list. I mean, it's really not the, that is not the, you know, that's not the one you want to win. <laughs> and, you know, you look at, um, there's a California nonprofit, ch state chartered nonprofit, California Housing Partnership, which does a study each year, a survey of aff housing affordability across the counties of Los Angeles. And essentially, how many people are in extreme poverty? So there is like, you know, extremely low income, 30% of very median. And how many units of affordability are available to people of that income level? So, you know, they look at extremely low income, very low income, low income, and the units of affordability that are available to them. And the gap, and they, you know, articulate what the gap is. So the gap in Los Angeles County, you track that, you look at their reports over the last several years, this, this really disheartening picture of the gap widening over time, which is like the opposite of what we need. But the gap in this year is 567,000 units of affordability in the County of Los Angeles. So you think about like, you know, that's, that in itself is a major American metropolis. That's what, you know, we're, that's the, you know, the sort of you, the level of, of housing affordability that we need to inject into our housing market to get to a break even status with people experiencing poverty in LA. But one of the things that's, you know, those are all really suggestive, right? We have a really unaffordable housing market and we have a really high rate of homelessness and you think like, duh, there's a connection there. But interestingly, there hasn't been an enormous amount of work drawing the causation of that. I mean, you can infer causation, it's, it's intuitively obvious, I hope it is to you guys, but it is to me that, you know, if you make housing unaffordable, people in poverty, people low, low income get stretched further and further. And, you know, even paradoxically, that gets worse <clears throat> as the economy recovers. So in the recession, if you look at the, if you plot, you know, if you plot um, uh, the uh, unemployment rate against the um, vacancy rate and against homelessness, you'll see, you know, over sort of a decade, you look at when the recession hit, unemployment went up, but the vacancy rate went down farther turned out that there was a lot more elasticity in the housing market at that time than I think anybody sort of predicted. And homelessness went down as a result of the recession because the housing market softened more than people's incomes. And the people who are most likely to hang on by the edge had less job loss and we, you know, income loss and were able to, you know, be able to hold their status in the housing market better and as the market has recovered and, P and housing has gone up faster than wages, we've seen ever increasing numbers of people pushed into homelessness. So key, you know, housing affordability, from my perspective, is key. 
was just a really interesting report, a piece of research that was reduced, uh, uh, released last month by Zillow Research that looked at, the, looked at the connection between housing affordability and homelessness. Really fascinating piece of work that also drew some support for some old school federal benchmarks about housing affordability. Like, you know, for example, our, our sort of national benchmark uh, uh, rental assistance program is section, it's colloquially called Section 8, it's now the Housing Choice Voucher Program, but it's a federal assistance program, it's about two million American households on it. You have to be very low income or below to participate in that program. And just FYI, there's an extraordinary shortage of vouchers vis-a-vis -vis people who would be income eligible. So about 20% of the people who would otherwise be income eligible are able to get that program because there's just a scarcity of vouchers. That's an American phenomenon <coughs> that you know, doesn't exist in most other first world countries. But the benchmark there is that Households pay 30% of their income for rent, and that's been that's been the case for a long period of time. We look at, you know, sort of, and it was probably a little more seat of the pants in in when it was first looked at as a as a number. I mean, 30% is one of those kind of crude numbers, but the idea was that if a household was paying more than 30% of their income for rent or for housing they're stressed in, you know, the other things that people need: transportation, food, you know, whatever, life. If you push people beyond 40%, they're, they're really rent burdened, and above 50% severely rent burdened. So the idea was keep people below 30% of their income for rent, and the Section 8 pegs that, so you contribute 30% of your income no matter what it is. That benchmark was really validated by this data. So they looked at cities where the where <coughs> people were paying more than 22% of their income for housing, and homelessness starts to take off. You get to 32% and it skyrockets. Ours is way up above, ours is the worst in the country. We're close to half. So Angelinos are one of the most housing stressed you know, groups of people. And you know, it's not made any easier by the fact that like, we have a very high poverty rate in, in I mean, we think of, of Los Angeles and Los Angeles is an extraordinary economic engine powerhouse economically, we also have the highest poverty rate in the state of California. And that's including, you know, what we think of as rural counties that have, you know, significant, you know, aspects of rural poverty. And by the Census Bureau supplemental measure of poverty, so we are not the poorest state by any means, of course. There are, you know, many southern Appalachian states that have much higher, you know, just basic, you know, their income is very, very low, right? But the federal poverty measure is set at a basic level. It's the same number everywhere. If you use their supplemental measure, which takes into account cost of living, and the cost of living in California is much higher, we, California has the highest poverty rate in America. So Los Angeles County is the highest rate of poverty in the state of California highest by the supplemental measure of poverty in, this, in, the, in, the, in the nation. And we have these other scale factors like we happen to be the most populous county in America. So we're an enormous community. At root, homelessness is a housing affordability problem. And I would just put that to you. That, that, is, the, that is what homelessness is housing affordability writ large. <coughs> There is a mythology in America, because we like to think of individual sort of responsibility and agency in things, that it is about people's bad choices and or their sort of personal problems. The mode thought when people think about what is a person experiencing homelessness is someone with severe mental health issues or a severe substance use issue. And I'll just put, actually suggest back to you that that's an American phenomenon. That is not, you know, most countries take a much greater responsibility for people with serious mental health issues and serious substance use disorders. It is very weirdly American phenomenon to think that, oh, that person's homeless because they have a mental health issue. Like, somehow it's okay. But, like, even if we held that aside, that is not who's homeless here. The people who are homeless here, by and large, are not experiencing severe or serious mental illness, they are not experiencing serious substance use disorders. They are people in extreme poverty, and they're people stressed by an extraordinarily unaffordable housing market. Thank you. Okay.
going backwards here. Well, good morning. Good morning. I'm, I'm Dave Snow from uh, University of California, Irvine. This is my colleague, uh, Dr. Rachel Goldberg. And uh, we're going to be talking about the causes of uh, homelessness in Orange County. And uh, let me just say from the outset, uh, everything Peter said, we agree with. Okay, good. And uh, <laughs> our data may provide more fine yep. substantiation for his remarks, which I'm sure he'll be happy to see. Uh, first, let me uh, give the background of this study. The study uh, was originally to talk about the causes of homelessness uh, in Orange County, uh, Jamboree Housing, uh, United Way, and so on, wanted to know how much does it cost to keep people on the streets? Is it more costly to live on the streets than to keep people in housing. Okay, here was, that was the primary objective of the study. Uh, and so we looked at, interviewed uh, people uh, in different kinds of housing, but we also wanted to know something about the demographic and biographic correlates of homelessness and the, uh, and the causes. Different data points. With respect to costs, or county kind of strange. There's no major city like uh, LA, uh, or San Diego and San Diego County, there's 34 municipalities. Uh, so each a small community in varying degrees, with Anaheim being the largest one. So in a way, we needed to get cost data from the municipalities, from the 20 hospitals with emergency room, from non government a sample of non-governmental agencies in the county. This would give us our overall cost. Just in general, for uh, person who's chronically homeless, mm. that is on the streets for a year or more, with multiple disabilities, the average cost, 100000 plus a year. Mm. If you put that person in what's called permanent supportive housing, which provides wraparound health care, it's half the price. It drops to 50000 So, I mean, the answer is very clear. If you want to do something about homelessness, provide housing. On the other side, uh, we interviewed uh, a sample of 252 homeless, and these interviews were conducted all over the county in different kind of hotspots and facilities, and that provides the data uh, for the demographics and the causes of homelessness. Just quickly, who are the homeless in Orange County? 90% uh, were born in Orange County, meaning that most of them, were, very few of them, were migrants across the border. 68% have lived in the county 10 years or more. We often hear that the homeless uh, in Southern California are folks that come here because of the warm weather and the beaches. Well, in Orange County, uh, the vast, vast majority of the homeless are long-term Orange County residents. They're our citizens. Race, ethnicity, 47% uh, non-Hispanic white. 30% uh, uh, Latino, Latina, which is just a little bit under the proportion of Orange County, which is about 35% Latino, Latino. And 15% uh, black, which is higher than the overall black population of Orange County, which is about 2%. Uh, in any major city in the country, you will find that African Americans are overrepresented among the homeless. Mm. Median age a little high, 50, 67% uh, alone. Uh, 17, let's see, 6% married. You know what the proportion of uh, adults uh, married in the United States is about 60%. Those tell you uh, how isolated most homeless are. And then other. Uh, one other thing I want to mention is the 46% indicating poor health. If you do, if you look at national survey data on health by domicile Americans, that's only about 9%. And even for Americans living in poverty, it's only about 22% that report poor health. So <clears throat> it's not only being homeless, but without a house, but it's also the magnitude of health problems mm. that the uh, homeless experience. So let's jump to uh, causes of homelessness. I often think, I try to tell people, if you're thinking about causes of homelessness, think about the game of musical chairs, which we've all played. 
and think about the chairs at the houses. What causes the chairs to be pulled? What causes the uh, the insufficient availability of housing. And then think of the people who left standing uh, as the homeless. So we asked two questions. What causes the housing or chairs to be removed in short supply? And why some people are left standing rather than others? And it's the, it's the intersection, the interaction of these two factors. The structural factors which Peter emphasized and the personal and biographic factors that accentuate or accent, accent the vulnerability of some people more than others. So the 250 plus we interviewed, interestingly, uh, kind of consistent with, with Peter's observations, 40% of them uh, indicated securing or retaining jobs with, say, sustainable wage was a major factor. Another 36% finding or retaining affordable housing. Uh, other biographic factors were mentioned, family issues, 28%, drugs and alcohol, 22, mental illness, 17, physical health, 13. Now, going back to the structural, and this really illustrates Peter's point, in Orange County from 2000 to 2014, median, well, inflation-adjusted median rent increased 24%, income declined 10%. Look at that gap. It's that gap in any city in America in which homelessness grows. That's right. And as that gap increases, so does the proportion of homelessness. Another fair market value went for two-bedroom uh, Apartment, Orange County, uh, 2017, 1800 annual income needed 72,000. The housing wage, uh, 3487. If you're working in minimum wage, you need 3.3 minimum wage jobs to be able to afford that. That's why, for many families, you have people doubling up with two, three, or four workers in the same household. In Orange County, the percent of renters unable to afford fair market uh, value rent, 60%. And finally, what's the projection? Just taking this, keeping this gap in mind between the cost of housing and availability of resources to access that cost, projection for job openings in Orange County. What do you see? Except for police and sheriffs, the projections leading up uh, to 2020, all in the service sector. These are the jobs that pay minimum wage. And even if everything went up to $15 an hour for all of these jobs, it still is not going to get you access to fair market value rent. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Rachel, and she's going to dig a little bit deeper into the uh, causes. Okay, so consistent with what um, Peter said and what also what Dr. Snow has said, because the, the reasons for homelessness often cluster together, right, so it's hard to pinpoint just one thing, it can be helpful to do some sort of cluster analysis to look at how these factors cluster together. Um, so what we did here was we took the reasons that people provided in our survey for their most recent spell of homelessness, and they were able to say more than one. They were able to check off, you know, however many they wanted to. Okay, and we put them, we did a latent class cluster analysis. We did separately for women and men, because we thought that the reasons would probably differ by gender. And so what this pie chart shows here is the pieces of the pie represent the percent. Here we're looking at the reasons for homelessness among women. So the, the pieces of the pie are the percentage of homeless women that are predicted to be in that particular cluster. And then the um, graphs on the side show the probabilities of providing the, a particular reason conditional on, on falling into that cluster. So the most, um, the largest cluster that we identified for women is basically characterized by those structural factors, right? Lack of affordable housing, lack of jobs with a living wage, right? So maybe lack of a job or a job with a low wage, okay? Um, and the probabilities, if you're in that cluster, the probabilities of reporting lack of affordable housing or job loss are, are, are quite high. 
Um, and you also see some reporting of mental and physical health issues also um, within that cluster. Okay, but the predominant um, characteristic of this cluster that characterizes about three quarters of the women in our sample was this lack of affordable housing combined with you know job loss or lack of lack of a job at a sustainable wage. Okay, 21 percent of women fall into a cluster that is pretty much exclusively characterized by domestic violence as the reason for homelessness. Okay, so that's a good one out of five of the women in our sample falling into this cluster of domestic violence. And then a very small piece of the pie um, is represented by drugs and alcohol being the predominant reason um, for homelessness. Okay, now when we look at men, so for men the pie is, is fairly different. We still see that the, um, that the largest percentage of men fall into a, a similar cluster to the women that is characterized by lack of affordable housing combined with job loss. So 57% of men fall into that cluster. Okay, and then we see two clusters um, that both well, so both of them um, include, you know, drug use as one of the reasons, but the um, cluster two, uh, family issues also predominate, okay? And so family issues can be, you know, the death of a family member who maybe was a breadwinner for the household or an important social support, right? So some um, respondents, for example, mentioned the death of a parent as being a <coughs> factor. Okay, um, it can also involve you know divorce, that kind of thing, um, and then and and health also was was um, fairly important in that cluster, and then the third cluster, some combination of reentry, so um, reentry after prison, um, drugs and alcohol and mental health, some clustering of, of those factors. Okay, and then if we're talking about the biographic factors, we also asked about um, childhood experiences among our sample, um, and a, a very large percentage of women in particular reported um, abuse, either physical or sexual abuse, by a household member during childhood, and you can see from this graph that on the right, the columns on the right are the percentage of um, men in red, women in orange, and then the total combined women and men who reported ha having experienced both physical and sexual abuse from a household member during childhood. And you can see that about one out of five of the women in our sample reported experiencing both. Okay, about another fifth of women, um, or about a fifth of men reported physical abuse by a household member during childhood. Okay, and when you combine it together, um, about 40% of the women in our sample reported having experienced either physical or sexual abuse during childhood. Okay, and this table just gives some sense of um, kind of uh, victimization across the life course, particularly among women. So like I said, I don't know if I can do, yeah, here I can show. Um, about 40% of women report experiencing um, physical or, and or sexual abuse um, during childhood, and about 26%, um, so about a quarter of men, um, also reported this, okay. And then about a quarter of women cited domestic violence also as a reason uh, for their homelessness. And if we look among the women who cited domestic violence as a reason for their homelessness, 58% of them also reported experiencing physical and or sexual abuse during childhood. So we see these patterns of repeated victimization across the life course. Okay, and this table gives a sense of some other selected um, childhood conditions that we asked about, also disaggregated by gender, although we don't see actually many um, major gender differences for these. Um, but about, let's see, 42% of our respondents had a parent or another adult household member with an alcohol or drug problem when they were growing up. Um, about 14% had a parent or immediate family member who spent at least one night homeless when growing up. Quarter spent time living with um, non-parental relatives, so neither a mother nor a father. 
um, responsible for their care when growing up or lived, you know, some of them living with foster parents or in um, an orphanage in childhood, okay, and about 6% spending time in a, in a juvenile correction facility. So just going back to what we were talking about, kind of the things that, so the structural factors as being a very, um, kind of the, one of the most important factors, right, but these kinds of biographic factors just accentuate vulnerability to homelessness, right, among those who may also be facing these kinds of structural difficulties. Okay, so we're going to wrap up. Um, but just some of these are some of the major um, takeaways that we're hoping, you know. And, and there's a report that we um, that that Dr. Snow and I um, authored that goes into more detail on this stuff, and it also goes into more detail on the costs of homelessness. So you can find that if you'd like to see, you know, more detail on on, on our findings. Um, but basically, you know, one of the major takeaways is that homelessness, right, is a situation in which some people find themselves rather than a characteristic of right. people, right? So it's a social condition. It's not a social type, right? So we talk about people who are experiencing homelessness, right, rather than talking about homeless people, okay? The primary cause of homelessness for both men and women is this gap that Dr. Snow um, showed between the cost of rental housing and the availability of, of living wages to, to be able to access that housing, right? So the homeless you know, are generally people for whom there are no available or accessible housing slots, right? Because of this intersection of structural factors and you know, personal biographic vulnerabilities, right? So if this is the case, right, then homelessness is most generally a result of the kind of breakdown of societal abeyance processes that exist to modulate this mismatch between, you know, having, um, you know, too many people seeking a particular, you know, housing and beds, right, and too few positions or slots or beds, right. So homelessness, you know, to us is going to, you know, continue to persist until there's a functioning abeyance system for absorbing and accommodate, accommodating this, um, you know, kind of surplus um, population they're looking for beds, right? So the need for affordable housing is 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 really what what comes up. So I'm going to end here, and I'd love to hear from you. Next. Oh, thank you. Is it okay to touch you? Good morning. My name is Denise Smith. I'm a health team peer leader and an advocate of the Downtown Women's Center. I'm a survivor of the start from the beginning. I became homeless mentally and physically because I had unresolved issues and I went through trauma in my life I never dealt with. I'm a person that came from a long line of strong black women. We go through things and we didn't talk about it, we just pushed on. Whatever happened to us, we pushed on. We were not allowed to talk about it ever. You pushed on because we were strong. Okay, that was good to a point. But after a while I kept pushing, pushing it on, pushing it on, till it got to the place where it overwhelmed me. I couldn't be that strong black woman anymore. Things hurt. Divorces, you know, traumatized. My father that I love dearly, you took him away from me. Why? I never knew why. My mother never discussed it. She moved on. You pushed it under the rug to the point where I said, forget it. I had the last baby, went through postpartum depression, and I dropped out of life. I didn't know anything about postpartum depression. What happened to me? All the things that I pushed, pushed, and pushed, it overwhelmed me. So they got to a place I couldn't function anymore. No more. <coughs> I had a nervous breakdown. So I medicated with crack cocaine came along, which says, you don't have to stuff it, smoke me, and we can forget about life. Period. So that's what I did. But there was a break in it where I got it together a little bit, so I went downtown to Skid Row and got housing. But when I got the SO housing, I went in there with the 
unresolved issues. It still was there. So I didn't want to be in that room and have to deal with those issues. So I went outside with everyone else that was trying to forget and got high on the streets. So you counted me as homelessness because I never went on. I went there to pay my rent, shower sometimes, and I came back on the street and I sat and smoked and dealt with them issues. Up in smoke. So when you came out and counted me, counted the homelessness, mm -hmm. I was there. Because mm -hmm. I wasn't going to deal with it. The trauma, the trauma that I went through, no, not me. When I went in that room, that was, that's what it represented. Dealing with the issues. And I was not ready. It hurt too much. I wasn't dealing with it. Till it got to a point, the crack didn't work no more. Every time I smoked, here come the issues. Here come, where's my father? Why did you leave me? Why did we get a divorce? I could, why did I lose my job? Why this? What's both part of depression? Everything started coming. Every time I smoked. So one day, listen, <coughs> I went on my way to get my medication to help me deal with my issues. And this is the truth. God said, not today. Not one more hit that you can take. Because if you do, you will die. You will die. And that's serious. Right on the corner of Skidrock. That's when I decided to, he guided me to go down the street, to go to an outpatient program, to get myself together so I can deal with what I was going through. I had to. I developed chronic diseases. Didn't know I had them. I had a heart um, problem. Didn't know I had it. Because I was smoking so much. I was trying to smoke away what you did to me. What you said to me. Why did you take me from my father? Why you didn't tell me what happened? And then my mother died? So I didn't never get answers. Really? You leave me here with all this mess? I'm not a strong woman no more. I broke down. So the only thing that was keeping me up was crack, drug addiction, and alcohol. And then it failed me. Didn't work no more. So God said, okay, are you ready? I gave in. So I solely depended on him. He got me through every step. He got me through the outpatient program. I graduated. Then I said, well, God, I'm, I don't want to go back to my room because there's nothing there but drugs in the hotel. I want to do, do something. So he guided me to the downtown women's center where there was women in there that went through what I went through. But the only thing is, I was ready to share. And I shared. We have workshops there that I went to. I opened my mouth. And I said, you know what? I was scared. I'm hurting. I went through something. That's what I went through. Did you go through it? Then they started sharing. And I started healing. I went to the therapist. Start sharing what I went through. It's okay. I let the pride go down. I put the pride out and say, here, yeah, I'm hurting. I did this. I smoked. I went through it. I started dealing. I started get being a productive person in society. I saved my money. I lived at the Weldon Hotel or Maple on Skid Row. I didn't buy a crack no more, so I had money. I saved it up within four months. I moved from Skid Row and moved into a senior living in, in Crenshaw and Merck area. But I never forgot where I came from. I come down on Skid Row to the Women's Center Monday through Friday and I volunteer my services. I tell women, let's help each other. I tell them how the, the problems with my mental health and, and, and with my drug addiction, it made me sick physically and mentally. So when I have chronic diseases. So it is okay. I tell the women, I ask, I ask um, the staff members, let me work in the health program so I can tell the women how chronic diseases, when you don't take care of it, can kill you. So we come together and we talk about what we go through every day, mentally, physically, every day. So we can be productive women. We're smart. 
I'm an intelligent woman. Very intelligent. And I speak it, I talk, I communicate. I don't hide anymore. So I won't be homeless mentally. I was mentally homeless. Can you believe that? Paying rent every month for over 16 years? And I SRO well, never went there just to give him my rent and, and, and shower? That's it. Mentally homeless. That's dangerous. That was scary. I think about it today and I cry like, what? I was in captivity. Because I didn't want to let you know that I was hurting. That somebody divorced me. Somebody said I wasn't pretty no more. Somebody said I was aging. So they left me. Abandonment issues. I had issues. I didn't want to let you know. But today, I'll let you know, I'm not perfect, and I go through storms every day of my life. And whether you like it or not, however you look at me, it doesn't matter. It makes me strong sharing with you who I was or who I am. It's okay. I can tell you I spent thousands of dollars on crack cocaine. It might help you to keep you from doing it. I'm all right with that today. Every day, I come down to the women's center, and we cry, and we talk together. That keeps me. If it wasn't for God, in the name of Jesus, I would not be here. I got my degree of communication on skid row because it allowed for me to talk. I went through the dirt. I laid on the ground. My hands and stuff was dirty. My face was black. I went through it. I went through everything. So now I came out of it. I can help somebody. Because I went through it. And it's okay. It's scary. But I went through it because I thought I was too, too strong to tell you that I'm hurting. It, it's okay to be weak. It's okay to be weak. Because I, um, and when you can say you're weak, you reach out for help. It's okay. I'm not Mighty Mouse. I'm not that mighty woman. I'm not that strong. I depend on God every day. I don't depend on me anymore. And I don't depend on you. I don't. I depend on Him to make me strong, to go through the storms of life. That way I can stay in my house. I can pay my rent. I can save money. And I can stay healthy. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. That was wonderful. Um, so now we have some time for questions. Stephanie, did you want to, should I just call on people or did you want to pass the mic? Okay. Yes, Dr. Morocco. <laughs> Hi. My students are here. Um, I'm Anna Morocco. I'm a pro uh, professor in the sociology department. And so my Sociology of Aging class is here today. Um, shout out to them. Um, I wanted to see if somebody could speak to the issue of older adult homelessness. Um, specifically, you mentioned in the presentation that, your demo that the demographics were, the median age was 50, which means, of course, for those people who know how to understand and interpret media. It means that there are people over and people under. And so I'm just wondering if you can speak a little bit to that, um, that particular dynamic and experience of elder homelessness that seems to be growing um, in the US. So I can speak just briefly on the on the issue with regard to Los Angeles. So Los Angeles, in our 2018 point in time count, saw a modest decrease in the total number of persons in all age demographics. Well, totally, and also in all age demographics, except 62 plus. In that demographic, we saw an, a 22 percent increase. So obviously, we have a cohort of people who are entering that demographic very, very rapidly. And um, there are a lot of households that did not have much in the way of a financial buffer, and much of what we had has eroded over time. So, you know, I think, I think, I think we, are, we are really hard pushed to face into what we need to do. So we're, we're working with the, um, 
the resources that are available for um, people aging in in the county and city of Los Angeles uh, to to build bridges between our, the homeless crisis system and the and the, the systems that uh, address the needs of, of seniors. But um, we're not we're not ready locally. We're not ready nationally. And I think there's you know. <laughs> Yeah, we got a we we got a really serious challenge coming. Uh, what I want to say is uh, consistent with what uh, Peter just observed. Uh, you know, given the uh, age structure in the U.S. and the increase of uh, the older population, uh, people live longer. Uh, but that doesn't mean their lifestyles improve or their incomes improve. Mm -hmm. uh, the major source of retirement for the vast majority of people in this country is just Social Security. Uh, Social Security alone is not going to provide much money for housing in the LA County or Orange County housing markets. Uh, as the population continues to age, uh, the projection would be to see more older homeless people. Now, part of the problem with that is also uh, even for the, uh, the domiciled elderly, uh, they have more health problems. Uh, and so you're going to have uh, homeless people with multiple uh, health issues and, and disabilities. Uh, from a cost standpoint, uh, the cost of somebody living on the street will increase as well because of the cost of health care for the homeless. Let me just give you one example. Uh, interviewed a fellow at the Newport Beach Transit Center. He was in a wheelchair and had gotten off a bus but had just fallen off. Helped him back into the chair, talked with him and told him what we were doing and we were he could have a $5 gift card of, or $10 gift card of some kind uh, if we could talk with him. He had been home, he was 70, he had been homeless in Orange County for 17 years. Multiple disabilities, had had several heart attacks, had phlebitis, uh, couldn't walk, was in a wheelchair, high blood pressure, and just within the past six months, he had been to the emergency room, to an emergency room 12 times, he had been hospitalized five times, he had had 12 emergency room transports, and if you add that up given his experiences with the average cost for each of those in Orange County, you're already pushing three quarters of a million dollars for a guy who's 70 years old with multiple disabilities. So the projection is, Given our health care system, the, house, the cost of health care, and the increasing aging population, homeless among the elderly will probably escalate over time, and it will even be more serious in terms of, because you're talking about many folks that are on the street for a long time, uh, and the longer you're on the streets, no surprise, the more health problems you have. You know? No, I, I was actually just going to make that last point that we found, and I mean, consistent with other studies also, that the longer you're on the street, yeah. right, I mean, it exacerbates, yeah. right, the health problems that you might already have had, yeah. you know, at the time that you um, started to live on the street. So if you are someone who's, who's you know, 50 plus, 60 plus, you know, even in the general population, you're going to have an right, increasing um, number of chronic health problems if you're living on the street that's exacerbated, right? And then those chronic health problems can themselves make it harder to get off the street, right? Also, yeah. Did you want to say anything else to me? Um, myself and other women at the Downtown Women's Center is of age and their um, mental health is starting to decrease, their, you know, depression. And stuff, and it's really, it's really hard. They tend to turn, turn to, you know, alcohol to get over the depression because of embarrassment of the age. It's 65 and plus, and a lot of them don't know, you know, to be honest, you know, at this age I'm going to menopause. I don't know what to do. What's going on? And they have a tendency to push them to the side because you are with anyway. So, you know, let's bring on the new ones. So they don't even try anymore. They don't. Because they said, like, well, society don't want us anymore because we're too old. Our hair is too gray. 
when I the boy go. So they hide in the gut and they die. Thank you. Another question? Yes. What is the impact of that research at universities, the work of mm -hmm. corporations and activism can have in changing or maybe making the gap not so wide that a policy can be actually being set in place yeah. to change the condition, yeah. if that is ever possible. Yeah. So, so as I said, I'm, a, I'm an administrator, I'm a public, public sector professional, and it's my job to administer resources and, and put them out there. And I think one of the most challenging aspects of my job and, and addressing homelessness from where I sit is that um, the drivers are all out of reach. Hmm. So I don't build housing. I don't address, you know, I don't do anti-poverty programs. Um, I don't uh, influence, or <clears throat> let me come back to influence, but I don't do, you know, criminal justice enforcement. I don't do mental health care delivery and things like that. And, and so these root cause issues that we're talking about now, and I, I want to come back to the, you know, what you, what you brought up and what, um, what Dr. Snow brought up. The extraordinary disproportionality of African Americans in homelessness has to be elevated among the other things that we think about. Talk about housing affordability, and I think it's primary root cause. American institutional racism is an extraordinary driver of homelessness. And if we don't address that as a, as a culture, we are not going to make it. You look at you look, at the, you look at the demographics you just put up there. 15% of the population in Orange County, African American, against a 2% general population. Those data in LA County are 8% general population, 35 or 40% African Americans mm. are homeless, of the homeless are, are African American. That disproportionality is a collective, you know, result of many different factors of American racism. And we collectively need to take responsibility for that. I think if you look at one of the, one of the root cause drivers of, of, of how it drives people, you know, how institutional racism drives people into homelessness, have to look at criminal justice enforcement. When we looked at, so we just did a, a, a pretty wide-ranging exercise to look at black people experiencing homelessness. With a, with a, our, the LASA is governed by a commission of, a citizen commission, there's ten, 10 commissioners, and they had an ad hoc committee that took about six months to examine this question. Um, you should come to our website, lasa.org, and look at the report of the uh, ad hoc committee on black people experiencing homelessness. It's a really extraordinary product and kind of unique in the, in the nation for examining this question. but. You look at the percentage of unsheltered single adults who are black and have a criminal justice and incarcerate, history of incarceration is 64%. Is that okay? Right there, bam, that's a driver. You look at the non black unsheltered population, 65%. It's like, well, what? Wait a second. What that basically means is that people experiencing homelessness are demographically identical to our prison and jail population. Right? Extraordinary over-enforcement and over-incarceration of blacks in California, and we have had, we've been doing it for decades. We have created a situation where people are so economically challenged that they're, they're extraordinarily vulnerable to, mm. to, the, to the drivers for homelessness. So all the factors that go into making you vulnerable to the, to, to the affordability crisis that we just we went through are extraordinarily exacerbated if you have any kind of history of incarceration. Mm. You can't get a job, you can't get a decent job. You can't find housing, you can't find decent housing. You can't, you know, there's extraordinary, you know, curtailment of your, of your opportunities for economic advancement. So I think that thing, you know, I, I didn't, I don't want to fail to address that and I appreciate you opening a window to that. There is an extraordinary <laughs> opportunity 
for research and advocacy to inform public policy. And it's, we, we need it, and we, I mean, we're required to provide avenues for, for public input. But we've also tried really thoughtfully to create forums for that, um, at least in Los Angeles. So there is a table, um, it's sponsored by our allies in the uh, private sector on the United Way Home for Good team. Uh, it, I think it's a homeless policy research institute. So it's a collective collectivity of researchers who are facing into issues with regard to homelessness at USC or UCLA or where. And you know, we, we work with them to say, okay, these are the kinds of public policy questions we need research to give up, you know, to inform the answers of, right? So it might be evaluation of new program techniques. It might be, you know, how do we, you know, how do we address certain kinds of factors? What, give us an assessment tool that we can apply without clinical background, but will give a good reading of what the drivers are. So like, the, you know, the adverse child experience kinds of things or, or something like that. So re, they're really rich forums, but we, on the, I will tell you as a public policy person, very hungry for research that is impact, you know, like impactful on the questions that we are. So sitting down to, together to talk through like what would be helpful, creating avenues and forums for that, I think is really, really important. And the other thing is on advocacy, I mean, we, we need the voices of people who have experienced homelessness and are experiencing homelessness to inform what we do. It doesn't do <laughs> us or them much good if our programs are inaccessible, if our programs are um, not respectful and therefore people won't utilize them because they don't they don't acknowledge people's humanity right so our shelters kick people out at 6 a.m. that's no good if they don't provide opportunities for people's pets who, who what kind of person abandons their pet to go to a shelter no one you know if it doesn't provide you know up you know you know a lot of people with substance use disorders people you're, if you're an alcoholic and you need to drink every night mm. I shouldn't not provide you with a bed because you're drunk. Let's look at your behaviors. Are you disorderly? Are you threatening? Are you loud? Okay, I can't have that. But if you're just going to come in and pass out on your cot, okay, you know, we can get you connected to a substance use program, but let's, 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 you know, let's treat you as a human being and not as a, you know. So those are the kinds of things, that, and that's driven by advocacy and folks who, are experiencing these conditions, telling us, I need you, you know, I need you to be more responsible. Sorry, Dick. Uh, your question about uh, kind of bridging, connecting uh, research with uh, significant social policy and adequacy. Uh, I've been in an academic setting for, uh, gosh, the majority of my life. Uh, and this has been one of the most gratifying studies I've ever been involved in. And the reason why, is from a public policy standpoint, it's moved the dial in Orange County. You know, when it comes to homelessness, we can talk about moral reasons for doing something. We can talk about reasons of compassion because they're fellow human beings. But what really perks up the ears of some people is when you can show them there's enough, it's more economically efficient and effective to house the homeless. And that's what this study has done. And as a consequence, uh, there's now in Orange County uh, this coalition united to end homelessness, uh, which consists of various nonprofits, the faiths community, uh, the business for profit community. <coughs> and the governmental community all working together and pushing forward. The first objective is to construct and find a place for 2,700 new units of permanent supportive housing. And Rachel and I can say here, and it's kind of self-serving, that wouldn't be happening without this study. <laughs> so that's why I say, you know, so much of what we do is interesting. Sometimes it just stays within the walls of, of the academy. Uh, but this one has gone outside the walls and was conducted jointly with people in the community. And it's making a big difference in Orange County. Um, sure. So I'll just piggyback a little bit on that and just say that um, I think one of the reasons that 
this study in Orange County ended up being more impactful also for me than any of my other research that I've done um, is that from the beginning it was kind of designed that way, right? We worked together with the United Way of Orange County and with an advisory board of people representing, you know, actors and agencies at like different you. levels, right? So nonprofit agencies, government agencies, kind of at the municipality and county level also. Um, and all of that helped us to design a study that was going to be more responsive to the community needs. And it also helped so that once we came out with our results, right, there was a, a way of, you know, there were a lot of people who were invested in the research, right, and who wanted to get the findings out there. And the United Way was able to capitalize on that and some others by both creating this United 10 Homelessness Initiative, also conducting what are called, um, what they're calling Homelessness 101 workshops around the county, where they take the findings from our study and kind of supplement it also with results from other studies around the state and, um, you know, go into communities um, and and talk with people. You know, some of, I think, the most, because we know, my sense, I mean, I'm kind of actually new to this topic, right? So this study was the first time I had done work in the area of homelessness. Um, but my sense is that we know really what to do, right? And it's a matter of overcoming the resistance to doing those things, right? Overcoming these this nimbyism in the communities, right? And so, um, you know, so some of, I think, what the Homelessness 101 workshops and other, other um, you know, advocacy work that's being done can help with is to dispel some of the myths out there about who um, people experiencing homelessness in our community are. Um, also raise awareness of the cost benefits, right, of, of doing this also. Um, so, yeah, um, Denise, do you want to? Oh, nothing. Anything? Okay. Hopefully that answers your question. Next. Yes. Dr. Zamora, Hi, sociology is heavily represented yeah. here today. <laughs> I'm Sylvia Zamora. I'm a professor of sociology. Also have my class here, so I will give a shout out to my first year students. It's a course on Latino LA. I'm hoping uh, that they are learning of that sociological research is really cool, and we can use it to make a positive social change. My question is really on behalf of the class. So I noticed um, there was some data about that was really interesting about, um, at least for Orange County, that 90% of those who are homeless are US citizens and 10% are foreign born. So I might assume maybe a lot of the 10% are Latino immigrants, not sure. I'm hoping you can maybe just say a little bit about a little bit more about some interesting findings related to the Latino homeless population. Thank you. But we really, I mean, we could look, we haven't looked yet at the uh, percent, of what proportion of that 10% uh, are, are Latino. Uh, but just some uh, general observations uh, about homelessness among the, what, what is the Latinx population. Uh, I indicated that uh, around 30% of our sample uh, is Latino, Latina, uh, which is just slightly less than the proportion for Orange County, 35%. Uh, I'm not sure what it uh, is in that, what's LA County, probably about the same proportion. Uh, it's a, it's a, a f about, just about half, about 40, 47, 48 percent of the general population are Latinx and um, in the homeless population is about 35 percent. So there's a, a pretty significant underrepresentation in homelessness of the Latinx population. And you find that around the country. Now contrast that to what I, what we found in Orange County and what Peter just remarked uh, a few minutes ago about the overrepresentation of bl black Americans. So it raises an, what's kind of interesting about roughly the same proportion of Latinx and African Americans live in poverty. But African Americans tend to be overrepresented among the homeless. 
Latinx a little bit underrepresented in terms of their proportion of the population. And that's an interesting question as to why, and maybe it's a question that uh, your class could take up. <laughs> Good idea. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, I hope that's helpful. Yes, excuse me. Um, so I know that at our university that like housing is guaranteed for like your first two years of school. But like in the situation where we're talking about how housing in California is like very expensive, I wonder if you guys can like touch on like the dressing um, college students that are experiencing homelessness or maybe like action that's being taken for to like help them. So So the the challenge of homelessness on the transition age youth population is pretty significant in LA County as, as well. Um, and I think we um, one of the one of the challenges is one that um, Dr. Snow pointed to um, in skipping over the slide and sort of counting who's homeless. There are definitional issues with regard to homelessness that are, are particularly um, exacerbated when you think about youth. So in the HUD um, categ first several categories of homelessness, which is what we think of when I'm thinking about delivering homeless assistance through programs like uh, the ones that we administer, um, people who are sort of doubled up or couch surfing um, or are in, unstably housed and moving around and, um, are not counted as, that's, that's a category that's not counted as as homeless for the for our definitional purposes, um, but it is per, it is homeless from the perspective of the Department of Education, for example. Right. So, for example, where children may be with an aunt while the mom is living in her car at a shelter, moving around, the child, from our perspective, homeless assistance would or HUD would not be homeless. The mom would, of course, but the child would not. The reason education uses that definition is because the focal point for them is to get resources on kids that are extraordinary risk of, of underachieving in academically. That child is at, is at exacerbated risk, just like the child who is a HUD homeless. They have resources to address that need, and they can do that. So, from, so that's a, it's like appropriate to the resource base that, they're, that they can administer not appropriate to the resource base we can administer because there's many times more people who are housing unstable than there are people who are actual, you know, HUD homeless. And the challenge with regard to dealing with um, transition age youth, particularly college students, is that there are many, they're sort of moving between those categories and are, you know, instably housed and therefore like in a stressed mode rather than definitionally homeless from the perspective of homeless assistance systems. So one of the things that we're, you know, sort of collectively working out is how to, how to address that problem. Because I think, obviously, we don't want someone to progress from unstably housed to homeless. And the social infrastructure that's available to college students changes pretty dramatically when you're no longer a college student, right? So we don't want, you know, we don't want that to turn into a progression of homelessness. Also, it doesn't do you any good to try to study from living in a car, you know, or like moving around or 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 being on the sidewalk. And I think those are those are all challenges. So we have we have an infrastructure for addressing youth homelessness. We have worked to connect that to the community college network and to the, you know, to the college network. Um, you know, there's there's work to be done there, of course. And I will say that our, our, well, our resource base for transition age youth is sort of closer. It's certainly much closer than it is for single adults. There's an extraordinary gap in resources needed to address single adult homelessness. We're closer on youth, but we're not there yet. So there's still a sort of resource gap. But there is an infrastructure in place. Um, you know, the question is just like, you know, how to make sure that it covers enough, enough ground and connects to enough people. <laughs> There's also a challenge with regard to, um, I guess maybe sort of embarrassment or something along those lines about accessing resources. And you know, one of the things we do, we we do a special youth count to identify <coughs> transition age youth who are homeless. In the at the same time, we do our point in time count because. Um, national and and you know state studies have indicated that. Um, 
point in time counts undercount youth because they are not tip if those were unsheltered are not invisibly countable areas. So being homeless is is a very unsafe situation. People are at extraordinary risk for violence. Youth are particularly vulnerable and they don't sleep where they can be seen. So they might go to you know, just off grid, right? Commercial rooftops, behind and under dumpster. I mean, just like they get out of sight. So, point in time, might underestimate them. So, we do a survey, a daytime survey. We don't interview everybody during the point in time count in Los Angeles. We just can't cover the ground. It's 50,000 people. We just can't survey everybody. There are communities that do that. We can't, we don't, we don't, we don't have the, we don't have the people. We don't, it, it, the logistics are just, would be un, governable, but we do try to do that with the youth. And one of the reasons that we do it, we did an observational survey, and the problem is like, young people who could look really raggedy, which I mean, I, I was a pretty raggedy kid myself, could have a place to go home at night, whereas the, the, the young person who's literally homeless, sleeping someplace that is not intended for human habitation, is struggling desperately to maintain their appearance as somebody who is presentable and clean so that they don't get stigmatized as a homeless kid. And so observational information is not good enough. You have to talk to people, and from that, you, you keep glean those kinds of data that there's a, you know, and so you know, does that, mean that people are more reluctant to access services because it would reveal that they're in a, this really challenging situation and how do we overcome those kinds of barriers? The, the issue with homelessness among young people, not just college students, uh, is a much more serious problem than we're aware of, uh, in part because it's been an understudied group and also a difficult group to study, in part because of the reasons Peter uh, just gave. In Orange County, there's an estimate of uh, 26,000 uh, kids from K through 12 who are homeless or near homeless in the school systems overall. At local, at our university, there's realization it's not just homelessness, but also food shortage mm -hmm. among yep. college students, and those two often go together. Yep. In parking lots at UCI, I've, I've walked by uh, a few cars that uh, students are clearly living in. Yep. Uh, rarely did they move. Uh, they have curtains in them and filled with all kind of clothes and a little bit of bedding off in, in yep. the uh, back seat. Uh, the responsibility here is not just a governmental one, but also a university one, mm -hmm. to find housing uh, for these folks. Uh, part of the problem, though, goes back to they're not always easily identifiable, and it's not like they like to identify themselves for identity reasons. Uh, so it's, it's a problem that needs to be worked on, but that universities and colleges and citywide school systems are increasingly aware of. Mm. It's a very good question. Thank you. Um, it looks like we have time for one, I think, one more question. One more question? Ah, yes, please. Yeah, I was wondering, so women in the, this country still make significantly less money than a man in wages, but men make up a significantly larger population of the homeless community. Is there a reason or explanation for that? Well, <laughs> yeah, the question is why do, the, given the... Uh, still uh, inequality in rate wage structure for men and women, uh, why more men in homelessness than uh, women? Uh, I've been uh, studying one place and another homelessness since the mid-1980s, and the uh, population of men versus women uh, has narrowed over those years, where it used to be a higher proportion. But I also think, and some could disagree, there's a kind of lifeboat ethic at work. There are more places in Orange County for single women and for women with children than there are all for single men. Uh, that we count more single men doesn't always mean uh, that there aren't more women out there with children or by themselves, but uh, you know, it's tough for anybody to be on the streets, but it's really tough for a woman uh, because of a number of intersecting vulnerabilities. 
Uh, so there, there usually are more facilities to house women. Uh, and other measures people sometimes take to keep them out of harm's way. But women also on the streets often take measures themselves to, I mean, I've seen to minimize or mute their attractiveness mm -hmm. and also often finding a fellow to hang out with uh, for protection. Uh, so it's a complicated uh, situation, but I think part of it is a little bit of a lifeboat ethic too. Uh, that uh, you know you take care of children and women first and you know maybe more men are left standing. To Peter, did you want to? Denise, what do you think? Denise? Oh, yeah, anything? I think I forgot the question. About why women make less money in the US but why that? there are fewer on the streets than Want to make less money? Well, you know what? I, <coughs> I've been just thinking about that. We women, we make less money, but we, as women, we manage our money better. <laughs> we, do. <laughs> we do. I, I look at, I look at the, I, I, I observe men, the men make less money, and the men make more money, but they spend more. They throw it around at, uh, with their buddies and stuff. We manage this more, because we women. And most of the time we got kids. So we, 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 we don't, we pinch. You know why money goes. Men, they don't. They do not. Because we, they don't. I see it. I observe it. We don't. Especially because we, even with me, I know I have a budget, a certain amount of money that I have come in. Not that much, but I know. I go find bargains. I, every, I write it down on paper. How much money more I got to spend. Men, all they get their paycheck. They just, man, they don't, they don't, we manage money because we are the, the strong. We have to manage, we have to support, we have to lift them up. So we have to say, Johnny, you know, you know we, can't, we can't go out there and spend $100 with your buddy. Oh, I got money, I can make it. <laughs> We're the one that we got to, got to keep it, you know, in the pocket so we can save and look for it for the future. I just want to piggyback on that a little bit. Isn't it possible that it's also the higher incarceration rates for men, yeah. right? So that men are much more likely to have been in the prison population. And you were talking about how prison is the kind of biggest yep. Factor and creating homelessness, so then that's probably a, another reason why you see more men experiencing homelessness, correct? Sure. Okay. I do think that um, there's probably undercounting. Yeah, also, of women. Right, because if women are less safe on the streets, they may, similar to young people, right, right. be not as readily found in the counts, maybe not even as readily found in when we were doing our interviewing, too. But the but the demographic persists in in communities that have much much higher shelter rates than than we do, um, and I I would point back to incarceration disproportionate incarceration rates. But I think you know it's a vulnerability. I'm not going to I'm not going to. Uh, I will go back and look at my finances and make sure I'm doing. All right, so we have time for one one more quick quick question. Anyone? Okay. Um, fabulous. I just want to take a minute and thank our wonderful panel and thank you all for coming.